And this morning I wanted to start a, a new series, cue Kimberly, uh, for you uh, on the topic of growing up in the area of conversations. Uh, and I'll explain to you during the course of this month really what that's going to look like. But uh, the reality is uh, we need to learn um, to have some discussions with God and with each other uh, that are at another level to what we've known before. And so conversations is an area we need to grow in. And uh, as God spoke to me at growing up conversations, I began to wonder, well, what does that mean? And God actually began to show me the power of a conversation. And uh, I was like trying to get my head around what God was saying. And God showed me how powerful conversations really are. And if we actually knew how powerful conversations are, we'd be very purposeful and very careful about the conversations that we did have. And uh, so I want to show you the power of a conversation. I'm going to share a conversation with you right now, read one to you, and show you how powerful that it is. Um, it's in Genesis chapter 3. And so if you, you want to turn there, I have no chance of reading that without my glasses. So um, glasses, please. It, it looks good, too. Here's a conversation I'm going to read to you. Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. So the devil started a conversation with Eve. The woman said to the serpent, so she got into conversation with him, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. And so the conversation flows on. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For well, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. That one conversation completely destroyed everything that God had in mind for man and woman. That is the power of one single conversation. One conversation was had and our health disappeared. Our ability to live and endure forever disappeared through conversation. Our ability to see God face to face and talk to him as a friend disappeared through a conversation. Sickness, sin and death came in through a conversation. Conversations are powerful. Can I get an amen? But what I believe in my heart is if everything can be lost through one conversation in the garden, how much can be gained or regained through real God conversations in the church? How much can be won back through proper conversations in the church? If you can lose everything through a conversation, my logic tells me you can get everything back through a conversation. But God just needs to train us to grow up and have the right conversations. Is that all right? And so uh, this month will be, Craig, I'm sorry, very challenging. Um, and, and I'm not going to hold back from saying what needs to be said. We did a series on money the previous month and we didn't hold back on what needed to be said. And there's been breakthrough. And so I'm not going to hold back on what needs to be said here as, as well. And we're going to get breakthrough. Everything can be regained through having proper conversations. Church is not a place you attend, it's a family that you belong to. I say it again, church is not a place you attend, it's a family that you belong to. And my challenge this morning, what spiritual conversations are you having with your spiritual family? Because we need to gain back and get back stuff that's been lost. And our purpose and our kingdom calling has been lost sometimes in things of this world and we need to speak to each other properly and clearly and with the determination to get this back on track. And so I've titled this first message, Kingdom Conversations. So we need to learn to have some good kingdom conversations. 
Um, I've got some other messages uh, prepared uh, through the month as well. And we're going to be having uh, conversations around our holiness and sin. We're going to be having conversations uh, around our conflicts that we have with each other. We're going to be having conversations around encouraging one another. But this morning I wanted to start the series by having uh, a message about kingdom conversations. Proverbs says this. This is a scripture from within the Bible, the book of Proverbs. The tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. That is insanely powerful to know that we have the responsibility given to us to have conversations that release either life or release death. And uh, I tell you, if we can tune ourselves up and have the right conversations that release life into the lives of others, we will get an incredible breakthrough as a church. But we've got to have the right kingdom conversations. I want to say this up front too. Because sometimes when a preacher gives you the go-ahead to go and do something, people think, well, I'm going to go and have a conversation with her. That's for sure. <laughs> Pastors equip me for this very thing. I'd like to have a conversation with you. Well, I want to say this to you straight up. If you don't know and love someone with all of your heart, you're allowed to keep your conversation at the weather. Warming up, isn't it? Grass is greening up a little. If you don't know somewhere, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the level of conversation that you're allowed to have with them. If you're acquainted with them, then your conversation can go a little bit deeper. How's the family? How's work? A little bit more inquiry. Is that all right? If you have a friendship with them, then you can go a little further. You can say, what's the Lord up to in your life right now? What's Jesus saying to you? Right? There are levels. There are levels of responsibility in conversation. I do not want after a month to have a circus of a church where people, oh, I'll have a conversation with you. Um, and uh, no. <laughs> no, you do not. If you love someone with all of your heart and all of your life, and you're prepared to lay down your life for them and sacrifice everything you have for them, then you can say whatever you like. Jesus is at that level. Jesus said whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted to. Do you ever notice that about Jesus? I, um, I would have been probably not a very good disciple, uh, but I would have been with the other disciples, elbowing them, oh, did you see the look on their faces when he said, oh, burn, oh, burn. But you know what? Jesus is like, I'm going to take your sin. I'm going to take your burden. I'm going to take away the punishment that is uh, coming from the wrath of God. I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to leave heaven and come to earth. I'm going to sacrifice everything for you. And I'm going to die for you. So I'll say whatever I like. So when you get to that level, you say whatever you like. But I just wanted to make that clear because some people think, oh, I've been waiting for this word my whole life. I'm going to have some conversations. And um, I'm just saying to you, no. No to you. Um, time, place and responsibility. Is this the right time to have this conversation? Is this the right place? And do I have the reputation to say this to this person? Time, place and reputation. And so Jesus uh, could say whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, but his love for people was beyond question. And so I just say to you, just check your love for someone before you want to say something to someone. It's always a good uh, thing to think through. And so I want to share some thoughts on kingdom conversations. And um, I'd say this. The first thing you're taking notes about kingdom conversations is we need to focus our conversations less on church life and more on kingdom life. Some of you were saying, yeah. You get it? Some of you are thinking, what does that even mean? Some of you are thinking, what's the difference between church life and kingdom life? Um, and, and for me, I feel like there is a difference. I feel that the church is God's primary instrument in working in the kingdom, but it's not the kingdom. Uh, how many of you know God owns the lives of all the Muslims 
and all the Hindus and all the agnostics and all the atheists. You know the world's a lot bigger than the church, amen? We have a big heart for the world that the world can come in, but the world is a, a lot bigger than just the church. And sometimes our conversations are stuck in church world. Good service today? Yes, good service today. A little bit long, a little bit short. I love that song that they sung. I think the bread was a little bit last week. Uh, you know, and, and church conversations can be like that. And I think we've got to get out of that. It's an hour, people. It's an important hour, but it's just an hour. Church is just an hour. Right? God is working all the time in every place. And we've got to see that kingdom life. We've got to see the role of the church, which is you and me, in the kingdom. We can't just be looking. I get constantly frustrated with a lot of my peers um, in ministry because they ask, how's the church going? And, and for them, that's a certain framework or grid. And so I always say, yeah, things have been really great. We've had great um, ministry at school. Uh, and, um, you know, and they're like, yeah, no, how's church going? And I'm like... I don't know if I can have this conversation with you. <laughs> you don't understand that. Um, no English. No habla. Um, we are at work all the time. Is it true? We've got teachers who are ministering to students. We've got young adults who are ministering to youth. We've got all different types of, what would you say, categories of people sowing the gospel. And it's not happening on Sunday morning. Uh, yesterday, Sandra and Taya went out with a group of people onto the streets to take the, the message of Jesus to those who probably won't come to church. And one of the issues with church life now is that our whole thing is come, come to church when Jesus said go into all the world. And so we're a bit stuck in church world uh, talking about stuff to do with worship services. Worship services is not church. It's the church gathering that we have once a week. But we should be having other gatherings and be doing other things to build faith. And so when I talk about conversations, I think the first thing we need to know is we need to get out of church world and into kingdom world. I'm so glad that we have so many different ministries being led by different people and the different expressions. But how many of you know there's powerful devotions going on in the school with dozens and dozens of teachers on a Thursday morning? How many of you know that children are here on Tuesday mornings and Wednesday mornings as the gospel is being sown into their lives in chapel services? How many of you know that the youth have a meeting and they have small groups and the young adults have a meeting in small groups? And we have a biker church that meets here, did you know that? And we have churches that we support in Cambodia and in Thailand and in India and in Uganda that are also meet. And so that's all a part of the kingdom. We have projects that we're giving into that we, we probably don't talk enough about and all the rest of it but they have very little to do with a church service. I am all for church services. You will never not see me in a church service, but it's only an hour of our week. Um, you guys probably don't know, Zach and I have been preaching uh, you know, in the last few weeks at leadership meetings, at pastors meetings, at Bible colleges, in schools, and different things. And so there's lots of things going on all the time that are trying to expand the kingdom. And so I just want to say that Kingdom conversations, if you're thinking, well, what's a kingdom conversation? Kingdom conversations are this. What is my next step in building the kingdom? What's my next step? That is a real good kingdom conversation. Kingdom conversations stretch the hearts of people who are having them. What is God calling me to? Because it's not just attending a church meeting, although that is very important, and the Bible says never stop doing that. But it's such a small part of what God is doing. And so we need to be having real conversations with each other, uh, not just about serving in a church service, but serving the church. A lot of us are serving in a church service. There are people now... Uh, Renee and Tanya are out in Kresh. Uh Andrew and uh, Bree are up in Kids Church. And Will and Gabrielle and Wayne are up in Kids Church. And Anna and Julie and Faith are up in Kids Church right now. Esdras was here this morning making your communion. There were people practicing for worship. And all types of things are going on. But serving in a church 
Meeting is not where it begins and ends. Serving the church is where it begins and ends. That means when this meeting finishes, we can be cooking for people, we can be praying for people, we can be cleaning people's houses, we can be looking after people's kids, we can be prophesying, we can be writing books, we can be out on the street witnessing, we can be preparing our testimony. Can I get an amen? There are many, many things that we can be doing that is called serving the church, not serving in a church service. There is a huge difference between serving in a church service and serving the church. Some of you need to think about not only the tithe that you bought, but how to raise money for the youth so they can have a greater impact in the high schools in that area. That is serving the church. Some of you need to tune up in your gifting, your teaching, your preaching. Uh, can anyone work a miracle? We need to see more miracles. We need to see more miracles. And so we're not here just to serve in a church service, we're here to serve the church. And people in the church need miracles. People outside the church need miracles. And so there are lots of things that we need to be focused on and need to be doing. We've got to get away from uh, negative talk or self-talk, stop listening to those stories in our head and we need to be having good, honest conversations with people about what's my next step in building the kingdom. What's my next step of faith in kingdom life? And Jesus, I love, um, had some crazy conversations with the disciples about their next steps way before they were ever ready for them. And so I'm just going to read to you a few verses from Luke chapter 10. And uh, I really love this passage of scripture and I'll tell you why. Luke 10, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Please note that Jesus sent the disciples ahead of him. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go! I am sending you like lambs among the wolves. He's like, go out ahead of me. They're like, what? Could we not go behind you? He's like, no, go ahead. Like lambs before wolves. What? And tell them about the kingdom. Okay. Um, what is that? You've got to remember, these guys barely knew who Jesus was at this stage. He hadn't been revealed as the Messiah. He hadn't been preaching great messages. They'd just been getting together. He's like, go and tell people about the kingdom. And they're like, okay. What does that mean? On the way, they're like, who's the king and which kingdom are we talking about? And, and it goes on and uh, it tells them, uh, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in the house, eating and drinking whatever they give you. Jesus is like, go out, preach the kingdom. If you find a peaceful place, just eat all their food, drink all their drink. Give whatever they give you. The worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. They're like, oh, so are you guys leaving? No, you keep feeding us. We're going to stay here. We're going to eat all your food and drink all your drink as we tell this town about the kingdom. When you enter town and are not welcomed, uh, sorry, and are welcome, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. So, the difference between being a disciple of Jesus and attending a church is this. Hear me. It is very easy to settle and get comfortable in church life. Jesus does not know this. Like, right, you two, 72? What I want you to do, take no staff, no tunic, no extra money, no jacket. Go and knock on a door and see if someone will let you in. Eat their food, drink their drink. While you're there, tell them about the kingdom and uh, heal the sick. And, uh, you know, just uh, I'll catch up with you at some stage. So you go ahead of me. You realise you send them into towns. I'll be like, dear God, please come to my town first. This is so uncomfortable right now. I'm preaching stuff I do not know, doing stuff I do not understand. I don't even know who Jesus is and he's sending us out. What I see here is Jesus refuses to allow his followers to get comfortable. 
But you can get very, very comfortable in church life. You can just come and attend a church service. And I'm going to say some stuff in a minute. And if you are just attending a church service, just staring at the back wall, you might get very, very uncomfortable with what I'm about to say. But you know what? I love you and I care for you. And I'm only saying what Jesus has said to all of his followers previously. And so I'm just going to say what Jesus said. It might make you feel uncomfortable. That's okay. We love you no matter where you are in your journey. But if I don't say this, you're going to get even more comfortable. And that means you're going to miss out on living in the kingdom. And so if you just uh, sort of, a uh, church is a place that you attend rather than a community that you serve, then this is going to challenge you a little bit. Jesus does not allow onlookers. Jesus does not allow onlookers. I'm just going to stare at the sign real talk. And in no particular order, directed at no particular person, I'm going to say some particular things. <laughs> some of you are here this morning on looking at what other people's money has bought. And that's okay. You're on a journey. Some of you are here looking on at the gifts and talents that other people are using in this particular meeting. And that's okay. Some of you are here this morning looking on at the faith steps that other people in the church are taking going, wow, and looking on. And what I'm saying to us as a church that we have to grow up in the area of conversations because Jesus does not understand onlookers. He never gave up his life so that we could become onlookers. And if you're just looking on at other people's money, other people's gifts, other people's faith, you're missing out on having some very real conversations with people about the next steps that you need to take to build God's kingdom. Can I get an amen? I know it's uncomfortable. And believe you me, I'm uncomfortable because I have to take next steps. And you might think, oh, it's easy for you. You're the pastor of the church. Your next steps are a bit either. easy. No, they're harder. It's harder for me to take my next steps. God is starting to challenge me to write resources or, you know, I'm like, please don't say write a book, God. No, I do not want to be one of those people. But he's saying write resources to build up the lives of other people. He's saying stop being lazy. Stop being comfortable. You know, you, you're kind of, you're the pastor of the church. You've been here 10 years. You get to preach and, and all that stuff. Well, you're getting comfortable. And God's having some very real conversations with me through people that I know who are challenging me about my next steps. I'm like, I, I wouldn't have any idea how to do any of that stuff. And Jesus is like, stop. I'm not having conversation with you where you're trying to tell me, mate, that you're comfortable right now. I don't understand that life. I didn't invite you to that life and I'm not supporting that life. I'm like, oh, but I don't have the resource to do that. She's like, step out in faith and I'll give you what you need. And so don't sit, oh, it's all right for you to sit there spruiking off about being, uh, you know, taking next steps. What would you know about? It actually gets harder and harder to take your next steps the further and further you go along. Trust me. <laughs> I know I've been on a journey and I spoke to people who've been on longer journeys than me. Trust me. It gets more complex. Jesus did not want disciples becoming mere onlookers. They were immediately being stretched. You think about what he asked them to do that. I must, I would have been like, yeah, I'll, just, I'll hang back. I'll go after you. Someone's got to go after. Uh, and he's like, no, no, go before. And uh, so we're just really challenged by that incredible passage of scripture. Is that all right? We have to respond to this biblical reality of conversations, not about being onlookers, because the early disciples did not even know what that meant. The Western church has gotten very comfortable and we're a part of it. And I just feel challenged as a pastor, why should we put up with habits and cultures that Jesus was against? Why should we put up with habits and cultures that Jesus was against? We need to start talking about this. Are you guys all right? I feel like you're hating on me right now. 
we need to start having conversations framed around this is not a culture that Jesus understood. This is not a culture who our leader and our king and our saviour understands. Why should we put up with this? What conversations are we having right now with people that are stretching our faith? What conversations are we having right now that are making us afraid? What conversations are we having right now that are making us anxious? These are the conversations that we need to get on and start to have for us to grow up in the era of conversations. Why would God send another 100 or 200 people to a church where the prevailing culture is on looking? He'd be like, <laughs> Jesus, can you recommend a church? Don't go to that one. A lot of on was there. Um, and I'm being funny, but I'm just, it's heavy, right? So I'm just trying to chip away at the office. Uh, but if we're a church that has some real conversations about stretching faith and about getting out of the onlooker's seat and into the driver's seat, then I think the Lord will be like, let's send another 50 people there. Because these guys are on fire. They'll just catch fire. And so it's a very real challenge to me. We can pray for growth. We can believe for growth. We all, I believe, who attend this church have a, a hope in our heart to see more souls, to see more people understand what the grace of Jesus really is and how it works. We want to see that. But until we grow up in the area of our conversations, I think we're going to be held back. What accountability do you allow for these conversations to take place? That's a big key to this all. It's all very well thinking, well, I'm going to, go, I'm going to walk around and start challenging people about stretching their faith. Well, that's good. But the other part, because the conversation is a two-way thing, right? The other part is who is going to allow accountable people to start to question what they're doing? Who is going to allow people and say, you, if you want to say something, Levi, I'm picking on you in the front row. If you want to say something, Levi, to me, say it. Is that all right? He didn't die, I didn't die. We're both still alive, didn't kill us. But if I invite someone to say stuff to me, say what you like. And I'll pick people I know who love me and are committed to me. Don't ask your enemies to say, you can say anything you like. Don't do that. But ask people that you either, well, I'll say this word, admire, or trust, or respect, or honour, or they've served your life, they're invested in your life. Then you say to them, say whatever you want to say. Say stuff about my marriage, say stuff about my parenting, say stuff about my ministry, say stuff about my life. Say stuff about how I look after myself. Say stuff about my devotion. You can say anything you like. It's not off limits. But if you don't allow people to come and have those conversations with you, uh, then these conversations aren't going to get started. We've got to confront one another when our behaviour or motivation is subpar. That's a real relationship when we confront one another when things are subpar. Some of you are thinking, oh, that doesn't sound too Bible-based. Galatians 6.1 says, brothers and sisters, right? Family, the family that you belong to. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Sin here, when we see the word sin... We often think of adultery and murder. Hey, family, if you see someone in the family committing adultery or murder, go and confront that sin. Well, that is a very narrow definition of what sin actually means. Sin means missing the mark for the will of God for our lives. That's sin. So if you have an addiction, and that's missing the mark of God's will for your life, that's sin. If God asks you to give a, an offering, uh, you know, for some cause or some purpose, and you don't give it, that's sin. It's not my sin, it's your sin. Because God had a, a standard, a, 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 a calling, he had a will for you particularly to fulfill, and you didn't fulfill it, that's missed the mark. Is it true? Is it true? 
And so what Galatians 6.1 is actually saying, if you can see someone in your family missing the mark, missing the will of God for their lives, being comfortable, being an onlooker, not using the gifts and talents they were given, you're allowed to gently go and restore them. Come on, mate. You've been upset long enough. God didn't put a deposit of his spirit inside you that you could live in a fence or live broken or hurt or whatever. Come on. This is sin. You're missing the mark. This is not God's will for your life. I don't want to leave you in sin. I don't want to leave you where you're at. I care for you enough to call you out of that and call you into something different. That's what I mean when I'm talking about subpar living. If you see people that are afraid to take the next step, do you think that's God's will for their life? Come on, church. That's living beneath what God has called you to live for. And if we're family, we can go and say, what is the problem? What are you so afraid of? Why are you being held back? And I'm not attacking anyone. I, I, I love them. I'm like, come on. Why are you being held back? You know God has a greater purpose for you than this. What's happening? Let's have a real conversation. Let's have a real talk right now. Because you need to deal with this right now. Because I'm not happy as your brother and sister watching this go on and on and on. This has to stop. I love you. Jesus yearns and longs for you to, to get out of this situation. And these are the types of conversations that we need to be having. Kingdom conversations. What is holding our family, our friends and our fellow ministers back from fulfilling the will of God? What this scripture means is we cannot let one another live subpar lives. If you're called as a Christian to be generous and that's not flowing in your life, allow someone to say, what is your problem? What is it about money that you think that you're so afraid of? Or what is it about money that you don't understand that you can't get into the will of God, which is generosity in your life? I know people who have got such an incredible gift for making money. Everything they buy and sell, it just makes me sick. Um, they make, everything I buy and sell, it's always a loss. So I don't buy and sell anything anymore. But I've got friends who they'll just buy something for next to nothing and sell it for a fortune, right? And they're good at that stuff. But what I can see is they haven't understood that God is blessing that area of their life so they can find seed. So they can say, God, here's this money I submitted to you. What is it for? It's seed. And so if I love them and know them, I feel like, mate, you've got a real blessing on your life, but far out, you're missing the mark. Don't you understand why God is enabling you to do this? Don't you get it? And if I know that person, love that person, I can call that behaviour out. Is that all right? And so the goal of conversations, just because some people love to confront people, and I don't really love those people who just love confronting people, power trippers. Any, any power trippers in the room? Am I the only one? Power trippers. The goal of conversation... Well, they're whispering you. The goal... Everyone, is everyone whispering the name of a power tripper that they know right now? <laughs> the goal of conversation is connection, not confrontation. Connection. The goal of conversation is connection, not confrontation. I want to have kingdom conversations to connect people to God. I want to connect them to the body of Christ and I want to connect them to their kingdom purpose, their next step. The goal of conversation is not confrontation, it's connection. I want to have a God-centered conversation that connects people to God's will, to the body of Christ and to the kingdom calling. And we need to stop mucking around with our conversations. You saw from the, the passage in Genesis 3 how powerful conversations are. Everything was ripped away through a conversation. Well, I believe in my heart of hearts, through the church, God is empowering our tongues to gain back all of the things that were lost through godly conversations. And we need to learn to have them. And we need to learn to receive them. 
we need to start having conversations that are about next steps. Every person from somebody who's just looking on, wondering who Jesus is, to the pastor of the church needs to be taking next steps. If you're here this morning, there could be somebody here this morning who hasn't given their life to Jesus Christ. You're just looking at his people and listening to his word and, and you're trying to make your mind up right now. Your next step, the conversation you need to have is what is holding you back from giving your heart over to Jesus? That's the conversation that you need to have. If you have given your heart over to Jesus and you're allowing him to, to organise and order your life, the conversation you need to have, your next step, is why haven't you been baptised? Why haven't you publicly declared, hey, something's happened in my heart, I've been made new, today I declare it in public. It's my spiritual stand. Don't expect me to look and sound the same to the person you used to know. There's someone else running my life. I'm going to demonstrate that my old life is dead and buried. It's covered by the blood of Jesus and I've raised a new life. What is stopping you from taking that next step? If you've been baptised in water, what's stopping you from getting equipped for service? What's stopping you from getting trained? Why aren't you being trained by someone who's a little bit ahead of you in ways to serve the church? What is stopping you from taking that next step? If you've taken that step and you've been trained for service, what's stopping you from giving your finances and investing what you have? Because the Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What is stopping you from releasing your finances and taking the next step, church? That's the kingdom conversation that you need to have. And if you're releasing your finances, then the conversation you need to have is what spiritual gift do I have inside of me? What do I need to uncover and begin to use to build up the household of God and to uh, serve the community around me? Why are you not having conversation? What is my gift? I don't understand if I'm meant to be, uh, you know, I have the gift of hospitality. I would say this to you guys about your gift increasing and growing. We don't often do this, but I just want to um, honour my wife this morning who has an incredible gift of hospitality. Um, and, and I'll just talk to you about it for a moment because when it started, it was all about cooking and serving other people at the table. Even this week, there's been three lots of people just during the week that have come and eaten a meal with us that Paula has prepared. Uh, and often a lot of other food goes home as well. And I'm very covetous of that food. And I see it just loading up a bag, four meals, five meals. I think, how many meals do you think they need? Six meals, look at me, I'm wasting away. Seven meals, eight meals or whatever. But what I've noticed over our couple of decades as Christians as that gift of hospitality, right, because the conversations have been had around it. What is the next step for this gift? And it doesn't just look like having people over. And the gift of hospitality isn't just cooking, by the way. It's when people come to your home, they feel special. They feel like a king or a queen for a few hours. A lot of people live in downtrodden situations, pressurised situations, ugly situations. But when you come to the home of a person who has the gift of hospitality, you feel like a king or a queen for a while. But I've watched that gift develop into the cooking of, I couldn't even begin to tell you how many tonnes of food over that time, but more than that. You know, the gift of hospitality, when it's exercised properly, has prompted my wife to adopt children because that is opening up your world to the world of other people. That's what hospitality is. It hasn't just stopped at cooking and cleaning, it's come to adoption. Now she's getting obsessed with another nation of people, of orphan, orphans in Cambodia. And so the gift of, you think, oh, that's a missionary gift. No, it's not. For her, it's just that gift of hospitality. I, I, I need to open my world up to the world of other people. I need to pour out what I have into them so that they feel more than what they are and not less than what they are. And, and what I'm saying to you is that we, we pussyfoot around about talking about these things. Um, you know, oh yeah, I've got a gift of hospitality. Have you? What does it look like? How big is it gonna get? How huge is it gonna become? Is it gonna involve the mission field or adopting children or is it just gonna stay at the cooking stage? And if you're at that stage, good for you. I'm not bothered, I know what God can do. 
right? But the point is, if you're not having those conversations and, and saying, I can't get comfortable, I've got to fulfill the, the will of God for this gift and to allow it to increase. And so, uh, sorry for that little sojourn. I didn't um, mean to say that, but um, I'm glad it's said. And so, if you develop your gift, what's stopping you from sharing your faith? What's holding you back, right, in your kingdom journey? What conversations do you need to have, honest ones, about why you're still intimidated about your testimony and about sharing your faith? What's stopping you from telling people how Jesus came into your world and has changed it and radically turned your world upside down? What's stopping you from telling people what it feels like to be fresh and clean and know the presence of God? What does it feel like to run into the presence of God when you've got sin in your life and say, Dad, help me. Clean my life up. What's stopping you from taking that next step of healing, church? What conversations do you need to have to help you remove bitterness and brokenness from your heart? Because we're not here to play church. We need to grow up in the area of conversations. What deliverance do you need? Some of us have got some very bad habits and addictions. What conversation? Who do you need to talk to about your addiction? Because whenever you're living in addiction, you're not living in freedom for God. And you're stuck and you're not taking your next step. Whose next step needs to be a season of prayer and faster and fasting? And let me just say this to some of you. Some of you, your next step, you might be giving your heart to the Lord, you might be baptised, you might be serving and developing your gifts and talents, you might be giving, you might be getting healed, and you might be sharing your faith. But what's stopping you from taking the next step of mentoring the lives of other people? That's your next step. And I've just got to tell you, there is never an end to taking next steps. But if we don't get our conversations right, we're going to just build a church where people get comfortable and become onlookers. And it is nothing that the Bible knows or understands. And it's, it's difficult for me that we call ourselves uh, Christians or we refer to ourselves as Christians, but we actually are not having the conversations that we need to have with each other to work out what that looks like. Because being a Christian looks like a life of sacrifice. Because Jesus Christ, the my follow, lived a life of sacrifice. John 10 45 said the Son of Man did, sorry, Mark 10 45 said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So the person we follow is not here to be served. He's here to serve and give his life as a ransom for other people's lives. And if you're an onlooker, you need to be having some serious conversations about your next steps. Real men, real women, real people of faith will actually stretch the hearts of their friends. They'll say, come on, let's have a conversation. Let's have a real talk right now. You've gone back into your shell. You used to live with a passion for Jesus and now you seem to have found a comfort zone. What is going on? Let's talk. In the book of Isaiah, it says, Come now, let us reason together. Come now, let us reason together. And God begins to tell the prophet how he's going to take the people's sin and make them as white as snow. But first of all, he says, Come on now, let's talk. I'm doing something. I need you on board. I need you to understand and capture the good news. I need you to reason with me.